Hi, I'm Caroline Payson. I'm Director of Education at Cooper Hewitt. Hi, Halima Johnson. I'm the Youth Programs Manager at the Cooper Hewitt. And we're really excited to be here, to have been invited here, and um, especially at a conference that's focusing on the idea of collaboration, because this badging project that we've been working on is all about collaboration. It's about collaborating with other cultural institutions. It's collaborating with lots of groups that focus on working with teens, particularly underserved teens. And it also, um, we're really delighted to say, is part of a, a collaboration with ACAD, where we hope to really take it beyond the first steps that we're doing now and are thinking about it as a national model. Model. Um, before we start, I want to tell you a little bit about the Cooper Hewitt, which is no longer called the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum. We have been closed for three years and have undergone a huge rebranding project and an enormous um, remodeling project, and we're delighted to be inviting everybody back to the museum in 35 days, um, which is a little surprising they let us out. Um, we're opening on December 12th. Um, but we are now Cooper Hewitt, not the Cooper Hewitt. We've lost the hyphen, and we are the Smithsonian Design Museum rather than the National Design Museum to kind of reflect the fact that we are at the one Smithsonian Museum that's focused in design and the only museum in the United States focused exclusively on historical and contemporary design. And that's our um, home, which is Andrew Carnegie's mansion on Fifth Avenue, um, designed to be a simple home for three if you don't count all the people who live there helping the Carnegies live simply. <laughs> uh, we would encourage you all to um, look at our website, again, our newly rebranded website. Um, Pentagram did our branding, hence all the capital letters. Um, and it's a new font called Cooper Hewitt, or Coo Hue, as we've been calling it back at the museum. Um, it is downloadable for free if anybody wants to play around with it. We've had almost 10,000 downloads of it thus far. We have also been working with 3D sim systems and have done, since the mansion was empty, 3D scans of both the inside and outside of the mansion, and all of that is downloadable for free on the website, too, in case people want to play around with it. Um, our new slogan as we reopen is play designer, so we want people to really across the board get into the idea of design and design thinking and the process of design and to do it in fun ways. Um, we run many things from our uh, the education office. One is the National Design Awards, where we choose winners in all fields. And I'm throwing some of this out there because I have the opportunity in front of you all to say, please go onto our website and nominate people you think should be winning the National Design Award. It's an open system. We want people from all over the country, and this is an exact audience you people should be helping us figure out who we should be honoring. So please go on the website and um, submit names. We, like many museums, run public programs. Um, we're delighted that those will be happening in the muse back in the museum in 35 days. In the meantime, we have been running them all, all over the place at other museums, in other places. In our new we have an education space in Harlem. This is a program we did um, last week. We got a grant from the Smithsonian Latino Initiatives to do a program that focuses on Latino designers. And all of these are, we're, this is the first of the series. This is Narciso Rodriguez, Maria Cornejo, and Francisco Costa of Calvin Klein being interviewed by Natalie Morales of NBC News. Um, we're going to be doing one on comic book artists as well, um, and one on product design. So these are all free things that will be on our website, and you're welcome if you're in New York, of course, to come. But you might want to refer some of them to, for your students. We run family programs. This is our space in Harlem. Um, which we are hoping to keep open after we reopen. Um, and are doing an initiative called Design in the Classroom um, that we created while we were closed and had no folks coming to us. It's a 45-minute design activity designed for kids to experience the design process. Um, we go into classrooms with a bag of simple materials, and in the bottom of each bag is an age-appropriate design challenge. So for little kids, it might be an older woman in my building needs to carry a, bag, a heavy bag up the stairs. But for high school students, we're, we have created more in-depth ones that might, in fact, link more to STEM things. So it might be, I need to keep a baby warm in a place without electricity. So um, the, each team breaks up into a small each team sort of gets a challenge, does a quick working, a quick prototype, and then presents. So it's a great way to sort of spark design skills. And from there, we want to refer them to our 400 design-based lesson plans on our website.
Um, we've been really excited that this project has actually, we've gotten a couple of grants to train teachers around the country to be able to use this workshop. Um, so this is actually a group of teachers from Cleveland. Um, we've been working in Cleveland, New Orleans, San Antonio, Minneapolis, Washington, DC, and New York, and we've been playing around with this pilot in training teachers to think about putting design thinking in their classrooms regardless of what they teach. Um, so many of the teachers we work with teach math or science, um, history, as well as um, our teachers. And we've been working with, because um, we'd like to collaborate, um, Young Audiences, which is a group of teaching artists that go in often in the after school space. And we're working on becoming their design provider. Um, but the program we're here to talk about today is Design Prep, which is our program in the after school space in New York City to reach predominantly underserved kids who have an interest in design and um, or a burgeoning interest. Um, we serve in this program, I think we had 1,200 registrations in the, in the last calendar year and of those about 625 of them were, were individual um, registrations. So we serve over 600 kids, um, many of them come back for several events. Um, the vast, vast majority of them are from New York public schools. 85% of them are from underserved populations. And I think in our last um, review, 90% of them qualify for free or reduced meals. So this is a program that's designed to help these kids um, explore their interests. And the focus of it is a little different from some of the after school programs or Saturday programs um, of some of our colleagues, like the folks at Parsons. You know, a lot of the art and design schools do Saturday programs where the kids get lessons in, you know, they'll take something in drawing or 3D. For us, because of who we are, our focus is on getting people to think like designers. So our workshops actually give kids sort of deep immersion experiences in some kind of design process so they get a sense of what it is like. Mm -hmm. um, so it might be um, a week with Monica Pion, the, the jewelry designer, or a week with Todd Oldham designing space. Um, one of the cool things about being the Cooper Hewitt is we're often able to get um, professional designers to come in and work with the kids. And again, our job is often to provide that translation piece. This is actually a workshop with Heath, with, no, this one's Heath Ceramics. Um, the heat ceramics people came in from California um, and the kids were able to sort of make beads, understand the process of heating them up and glazing them and then making jewelry from them. Um, we often, we also twice a year introduce kids to um, the idea of art and design as a profession and the idea of going to art and design school at our teen design fairs. We do one in Washington, D.C. Um, in collaboration with the White House and the National Design Awards and another in New York. This was on October 13th. Seventh, sorry. Um, this was at FIT, and it was a collaboration. We had the space from FIT. We were lucky that SVA was one of our sponsors, as was Target. And as you can see, we had a bustling room full of high school kids who were super interested in, in art and design. We had over 350 kids who came on their own after school. It helped a little that Tim Gunn was our keynote speaker. They had the opportunity to sit almost speed dating style and talk to a lot of designers. Um, and we're also super excited that it's an opportunity for these students to get information about um, art and design colleges, particularly ACAD colleges. And um, we worked, we've been collaborating with Deborah on that. And just to give you a sense of some of the colleges who came, we had the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, the New Hampshire Institute of Art, we had um, the College for Creative Studies, SVA, the Cornish School of the Arts, FIT, MICA, Pratt, um, the Art Institute in Chicago, Parsons, and California Institute of the Arts. So we're always delighted for, to have more and more folks there. So I'm going into such detail with this because I want you to, get a, to have an understanding of all the kinds of programs we're doing that might factor into badging. So we have our big team design fair. We have hands-on workshops, as I discussed, led by designers. We have studio visits so kids can get an understanding of what happens in a design studio. We've learned from our teen design fairs that the most popular questions from kids are, how did you know this is what you wanted to do? How did you explain it to your parents? What, how do you, what do you do during the course of your day? And what's the biggest mistake you ever made and how did you fix it? So super interesting to think that that's the orientation that kids have to this. Um, we also, for a smaller group, are able to take kids on college tours and a visit to design camp. So all of this was sort of feeding, this is what we do, and we had several years ago an opportunity to think about how we might badge that. 
Um, for people who aren't familiar with the idea of badging, um, badge is the term people are using now, think sort of digital Girl Scout, Boy Scout badges, ways of earning things. But um, the term that might, not go, that might not go away is the idea of micro-credentialing. We live in a world right now where more and more people are learning things in informal ways and are more and more invested in somehow collecting those and showing them to people. And so the MacArthur Foundation in particular has been, been very invested in how to connect underserved youth to technology, and in particular, how does that technology revolve around badging and micro-credentialing to help these kids use the technology for college and career readiness and preparation, but also to think of them to, to sort of spur on being lifelong learners. So the, our first foray into badges several years ago was part of a Haystack MacArthur Foundation project where 500 people were asked to pitch in one paragraph form what they would badge. And we wrote a paragraph about badging our high school programs. A hundred, then there, it was voting online and 100 of us were chosen from online votes to go to California for the day and we were match made with digital companies. And we were given a day to rehearse and we had to give a, a 15 minute presentation of how we would badge. And of that, those 100 of us who went, 15 of us got a grant to badge. And we were in that first group with NASA, um, Disney, Girls and Boys Clubs, and also what was interesting, the Department of Health and Human Services and the, the military support groups, because what they got a grant to badge for was how to badge the work done in the military so that when you get out, an employer can look at what you have and have an understanding of it, how, of how it relates, which is, again, a great way to think about badging, like how do you demonstrate this? So we were super excited. We got our first grant um, of not an inconsiderable amount of money, and we decided with our high school kids to badge everything we did. So we gave, the, we badged everything, you easily got a badge if you just showed up. You got an extra badge if you wrote something. You got another badge if you put a picture to it. And in our first group, when 600 kids were given access to actually badge things, um, oh, actually the first thing we did was to have a group of seven students to design the badges, mm -hmm. which was super interesting. And we were the only people of any group that had actually suggested that the participants design the badges. But of course, yeah, that was perfect for us. We launched badges to 600 kids. And when we launched it to 600 kids, nine people said they would take them. Which made us, which is never a good thing in the middle of a grant where you got like $180,000 to spend. <laughs> That's an enormous, you know, student per, um, uh, we could have sent them all to college for that. So. Um, we went back and we were lucky that simultaneous to that, we were working on a 24 session high Viz MacArthur funded collaboration between um, all of the cultural institutions that, in New York that work with underserved youth. And simultaneous to this like badge free for all, we were doing a 24 session workshop with Chris Bevins, who's the head of design for Billionaire Boys Club. And we took 12 students through a very deep dive in the design process from mood board to actual production of their clothing. And we tried to badge that. And the huge takeaway that we got from that was in that project, 12 kids earned 68 creating badges based on their ideas of creation and 230 on the skills that they were exploring. So when we had a deep dive and asked the kids what, how they wanted to earn them, they actually came back to us and with our focus groups wanted them to be harder. They wanted to be able to demonstrate them to other people, particularly um, teachers and guidance counselors and perhaps college admissions folks. So we were really lucky that we had those two tracks because the thing that we thought would work really well with that age group didn't work. The free-for-all badging works great with little kids who want more and more badges and just want to show them. And it works really well for parents, um, particularly with cultural institutions who want to sort of have those badges add up and get free parking or coffee, right? So those groups, it worked really well. And I think other groups might have panicked in the middle of this when they saw how, how challenging it was in our first go around, but because we're a design museum and embed design process in what we do, I think we were able to say, okay, it isn't working for our user. Let's interview another, our users and find out what they're saying to us. So we were able to course correct based on that and get a lot of data. So um, I'm gonna turn this over to Halima, who's gonna talk about 
what a badge is in a sort of technical sense, and she'll also talk about how we took that data and put it into our team program. Absolutely. So we are talking a lot about digital badges, um, and I think you probably had the same reaction that a lot of our students had when we started to discuss this idea of you're going to earn badges in the workshops, and we're going to, you know, give you these credentials for the stuff that you're doing, um, which is what is a digital badge, and what does it do? Um, so a digital badge <clears throat> is this graphic was borrowed from openbadges.org, and I think it really conveys the concept of a badge, which is that on the outside, it generally has an image, a badge signifier. So it might look like a badge that you're used to seeing, a, a Girl Scout or Boy Scout badge, something that just represents the idea of, of what's being earned. But underneath, the, the guts of, of a badge is actually just a series of code. And this code allows information to be transferred easily between different sites, between different organizations, and between even the issuer and, and the earner. So this information is the, the name of the badge, which can be anything, as well as a description of what the badge means. What is it for? What is it about? What were the criteria for this person to earn a badge? What did they have to do in order to get it? Uh, who gave the badge? So in our case, we are the issuer. The Cooper Hewitt is the one underwriting or signing off on all the badges that we give to the students. What evidence was required? So if there was, you had to write something to get this badge, did you submit a particular item? All of these things become embedded in the badge itself. Um, there's, there can be the date as well as standards and evidence and tags that go along with this information. So a one way to think about it is early um, email was something that happened within closed networks. I could talk to, I could send you a message because we're on the same network, but those networks didn't talk to each other. What Open Badges is, is a system that's shared across multiple networks so that students or adults, um, any earner can actually receive this information about what they've done or about a certain um, accomplishment and then share that information on social media, on websites, on other networks. So this is really a mobile or a shareable uh, signifier of an accomplishment or achievement. This open aspect of a badge means that now you can take it and spread it across the web. And that's really the, the power of making badges digital. So while a lot of badges um, that people have earned in the past might be siloed in their specific organization, you might have achieved something within the Girl Scouts, but that doesn't go anywhere else. Now you have these badges that you can earn in one institution, say NASA, but then share with not just Facebook, not just LinkedIn, but share with your profile page on your own website or share with another company. Um, the, it allows for a lot of mobile transference of information, and that's the, the power of what a badge can do. So there's a lot of coding and sort of technical speak behind the badges, but really it's just a unified system of information that can be spread. What it doesn't do is, is tell you what each badge does. So it kind of is a format, but it doesn't have you, you still have to supply the description. And I think that's where, where what Caroline was mentioning about this design process comes into play. What we've had to do is look at the, the, the process of coming up with how, what do badges mean for us and sort of badges as a whole. It's a relatively new field. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the process that we went through and then we'll have some time at the end if you have additional questions about badges. So what we have is, this is a, a matrix that we came up with to talk about what we imagine badges to be and how we would use them. And it's very sort of multi-layered and complex. We figured we would highlight all of the different disciplines that we focus on within design prep, all of the workshops that we do, 
and then create a game-like system where students can sort of level up their experiences and their skills in order to earn more badges. And we sort of developed this whole thing and started to pilot it with our students, and as Caroline mentioned, didn't get very much buy-in initially. And one of the questions that we heard back from the students was, well, what does it do? We, they were earning badges, they participated somewhat, but they wanted to know what does it do. And that was a huge sort of question mark for us. Okay, so we have students who are participating, but they, as the user, are not seeing how this can benefit them or where it can go. So that caused us to really think in depth about how we can use badges not as just a, a gold star or a thumbs up, but a tool for the student. And we had done this actually with, uh, we brought in evaluators and didn't focus and groups focus for the groups. kids. Absolutely, so we got a lot of very in-depth feedback from the students. Um, and, sorry, and they were all about who they could demonstrate this to and what came up over and over again, in addition to sort of wanting them to demonstrate a degree of difficulty was this idea, and it's almost like Facebook versus LinkedIn, that when they were publishing their badge stuff, they didn't want to share every minor accomplishment with their friends. They wanted to share major experiences with people who might be able to help them um, in their, the course of their college of career. So instead of saying, you know, what they wanted was the ability to share what they did and have a deep dive with that, of that to write a description of what they did with their guidance counselors, with admissions offices at art and design colleges or other colleges, with potential employers. So that was the feedback we got from kids and they wanted to be able to attach things that indicated the credibility. So if they did a workshop with Todd Oldham, could Todd Oldham write a, a small paragraph about, what, a sentence or two about what they did so that when they applied to school, someone could click on that and say, wow, you know, it's, it's a way of sort of looking beyond a transcript. A transcript kind of gives you a sense of what the thing was, what a kid was doing, but it could be very different to have Todd Oldham say, you know, there's nothing that the, he won't do in order to, you know, this kid won't do in order to successfully complete something, and he has a great visual sense and sense of style. So it was a way of sort of demonstrating these kinds of things, particularly outside of school curriculum. We all know the arts to cut tremendously across the country. New York City is a place where a lot of that stuff along with the guidance has been um, decimated. So they were looking at, you know, what we realized is they were coming to us saying, how do you make, how can you fulfill fill some of that void? Yeah, we definitely, we discovered that our, our high school students are actually quite savvy. Yeah. They were like, where can this go? What is it gonna do for me? Um, and high fashion was a great experience working with students in an in-depth way. You saw that they earned a lot of badges. And at the end of that, when we spoke to them, what they came back with us was, okay, now, well, like, who's looking at this? What are, what, is this gonna help me get a job? Is this going to help me later on? And that was really important for us to learn from the students. The slide that I have up now is an example of one of the badges that we piloted during the uh, experience with high fashion. Each of the students came in and had not so much experience with fashion, but learned about the entire fashion industry by actually developing their own brand, working in collaboration with a team, and learning from professionals in the fashion field. So they learned about pattern making, about product life cycle, about sourcing materials. They learned about how to create a garment flat, um, an, an illustration using Illustrator, um, and about sewing. All of these things were part of what they learned. And so when we developed the badges, they sort of dovetailed with each of the workshops and supported what was going on in those workshops. So Suri, she worked with um, one of our mentors and learned about sewing, learned some basic skills, and then sewed this clutch. So that was what was submitted to then show her basic sewing skills that she was developing. As the students went through the workshop, they liked the fact that the, the badges supported what they were learning, but then wanted to know what's the next step. How can we take this for, forward? And that caused us to think about the fact that the badges were not just for between us and the student, but there needed to be a third party involved. And that's really um, part of how ACAD came to be our part of our network in terms of talking about digital badges. So I had a very um, interesting and enlightening experience where 
these students from high fashion came into our offices and did mock interviews with staff members. And these staff members just talk to them about, you know, what, do, what have you done? They do a, a brief interview as if they were looking for an internship or, or possibly a college um, position. We got a chance to look at the resumes that the students brought in for this experience. And when they mentioned high fashion, it was on the bottom of the resume, underneath like other experiences. Swim team. <laughs> Swim team, <laughs> high fashion. And when they noted it, it was like a fashion workshop with Cooper Hewitt, maybe. And, and that information did not convey nearly what the student had learned or accomplished. The fact that they'd worked in a team, the fact that they their experience culminated in a trunk show where professional designers from Rockaware, Billionaires Boys Club, and other urban uh, fashion brands came and actually spoke with them and looked at their work and talked to them about the experience. The fact that they uh, learned about the entire cycle of production, went to mood, fashion, um, mood fabrics and source materials, sewed their own garments. All of these things were part of the workshop that they participated in and none of that was conveyed through their resume or how they were presenting themselves. So badges sort of became a way um, of looking at how we can take the information that the students are earning and base that outward. So this is an example of a, a, a badge that came after, so sort of a later iteration of badges, and starting to incorporate information that is outward facing so that not just we and the student are communicating about the information or the, the skills that were earned, but those are then looking, it's speaking to a third party to convey what they've done. So this is uh, a typography design badge related to the DOE cover design competition that we um, support every year. The DOE does a competition with high school students in New York in order to create the new cover right. for their um, high school directory guide, which is like a it's like a yellow pages right. of high schools in New York um, because they apply to high school. So students actually create posters and then work with uh, John Emerson, who is a graphic designer, and Phil Jimenez, Phil Jimenez who is um, an illustrator and designer, to refine their designs. So what we ended up doing was moving it beyond just a contest where kids submitted, and instead the kids submit in the first round. 16 of them are chosen. We introduce them to professional designers. The DOE comes in as the client, mm -hmm. and the kids redesign their, their covers based on absolutely concrete client needs in a sense of production. And the kid whose final design is chosen gets it published in... Um, some, I think 50,000 of them are produced and published as well as a line of t-shirts and bags. So it's an excellent pro professional credential. Yeah. So this, this shows um, talking about the fact that in the workshops themselves we covered skills like learning about visual hierarchy, learning about how to employ emphasis in their design work. The, so picking out specific skills that were important and highlighting those, not just so that the student knew about them, but so that uh, anybody else viewing it would know what they had done. This is an example of looking sort of holistically at how these smaller credentials might add up to show a story or a picture of what a student's experience has been. So this is Emily and this is a, a prototype of what a series of badges might look like. So highlighting her experiences and also achievements through the work that she's doing with us at the Cooper Hewitt. The, it starts to paint a picture, not just for the student, but also for anybody else looking, that the, the education and the experiences that she's had become visible. So she can see them, but also we can see, oh wow, she's had all of these different out of school learnings and has been exposed to so many different um, parts of design and parts of the design process. So out of all of the experiences that we had with digital badges, we've come to sort of this, um, I would say, mission or, or statement regarding our badge work. And as Caroline mentioned, design prep, we, we reach a, minor, a majority of, of minority students, um, and we want to give them an opportunity to 
enhance their college application, support them, not just while they're with us, but for whatever the next step of their education journey is. So we can use digital badges to help develop strong portfolios and to, to support student skill development in these out of school experiences that can help to make up for what might be lacking in their in school experiences. So they don't necessarily have the art education in schools to make them excellent candidates for pursuing design careers. But the work that we do with our students, exposing them to design careers, exposing them to different design skills, and building this, this uh, body of, of experiences and skills makes them amazing at, at what, you know, going on to the next stage of, of their education. So this college applications uh, diagram is something that I put together and I think you guys all know what ACAD stands for but <laughs> not everybody we show this slide to does. Um, showing that generally students who work with us then if they want to go on to a, an art and design career they're putting together a portfolio of their work and some of that portfolio highlights work that they've done with us but that's showing just their samples of their work um, and that goes along with their transcript and their personal statement to give you some sort of idea of what who this student is and what they've done. And because there's so much interest in the world outside, we were really lucky that Deutsche Bank gave us a significant grant to specifically look at the ways we can work on developing badging to help kids apply to ACAD colleges. Mm -hmm. So this is the project that we're working on right now. Um, and so this second slide sort of highlights where we think digital badges can support or, or paint a fuller picture of who the students are by showing what the learning content was in the particular workshops that they participated in, by demonstrating what some of their interests are. Some students only come to us when we do fashion design workshops and nothing else, or they're only interested in architecture. Um, showing the, the exposure that they've had to design careers through studio visits and workshops, as well as their experience and competencies with specific skills. So coupling that with what you already see in their work samples, helps to give schools, um, employers, but also the students themselves a better understanding of where they might want to go. Mm -hmm. And the first step of that is actually helping them have better portfolios. So we're hoping to start with the portfolio and then move into it. So Halim has been doing a lot of work Around right now, portfolio. sort of thinking about um, so what our grant allowed us to do was not only sort of build out some of that back end, but to create a series of workshops that will then help kids put, have stronger portfolios to apply to ACAD schools. So we're actually in the middle of running a series of four workshops right now that have to do specifically with portfolio preparation, um, piloting a tool that can help students develop a strong portfolio <coughs> in order to take them into um, the application process. So we're working with professionals. We've asked um, uh, Divya Parachi, who works at Yay Ideology, to come in and speak to students uh, with regards to what a portfolio is and what it does, how to craft one, what kind of story it can tell, and what the different elements are that go into a portfolio. So students start to think about their their portfolio not from their own eyes, it's like, oh, this is my work, but from the eyes of somebody who's a reviewer looking for specific items. Um, there's also a documentation session where students work with a professional designer, Mar um, sorry, photographer, Maris Hutchinson, who specializes in fine art photography and documenting artwork. So they're learning from her about how to technically frame a shot, light it, but also some of the decisions that can be made in order to support their portfolio development. Um, there's a review session where they work with Victoria Ferber, who is a teacher, an artist, but also has done um, portfolio prep sessions and reviewed portfolios for Cooper Union as well as uh, Stony Brook. And so they work with her to identify some of the strengths or weaknesses in their portfolio by looking at the entire scope of it. Um, so that's an example of one of the, the submissions that they would do related to that. So they go through an exercise, they look at their work, and then they're identifying where are my strengths and what are some holes or what are some things that I think are missing from my portfolio as a way of really analyzing in order to go on to the next step. Um, the, there's a session for strategizing now that I see sort of where I am 
They'll work with Victoria again to identify, oh, do I need more life drawing? Do I need more, is there color that's missing? Um, sh do I need to show some multimedia work that I've done um, or that I want to do that's not being represented? Uh, and where they can get the resources to continue. And all of these sessions are mar marrying the, the badges with the workshops in order to help support the students in their development. And the purpose of that is then to take them and get them ready for a National Portfolio Day on the 16th in order to take what they've already done, get feedback from the professionals, get feedback from the schools that they're interested in, and then go on to the next iteration. So we're looking at badges not just as a way of, of demonstrating what the students have done, but also demonstrating to them the path into what the next steps are and taking them on to their mm -hmm. continued learning. So. so where we are right now, um, just to kind of wrap up with a couple yeah. of things given the clock. Um, <laughs> it's terrifying. <laughs> it gets bigger the more you talk. You kind of. <laughs> um, but where we are right now is, as Salima said, she's we're doing and we're lucky. Our funding includes the hands-on programming as well as is the badging back end. So she's we've been working on this portfolio prep project, and the kids are working on doing that, and that has been entirely informed by the three meetings we've had with other groups of ACAD. Um, leaders and admissions, a whole team of folks. So that's kind of informing the workshop content. One of the other things that we got back from some of our meetings with ACAD that has been fascinating is this idea of not just stopping with the portfolio, but as how do we, could this badging idea be a way of sort of getting together, helping is particularly underserved kids, but it could also mean rural kids. You know, it doesn't need, need necessarily seem, just need to focus on inner city kids. Um, but how could one look at the, all the work cultural institutions are doing in the space for underserved kids? And is there a way of sort of connecting those skills in a way that if a kid doesn't have a great art program in school, but they can demonstrate skills earned somewhere else, that that can actually give them a leg up on their application process, but also give them a leg up on being successful in these schools if they get accepted. So part one is the portfolio prep. Um, that grant ends in, in the winter. So what Halim is doing now that these courses are done is we'll then be asking some ACAD folks to come and help us review those so that we can badge that and sort of highlight the kinds of things that will make will help kids be accepted. And then in the next go around, we imagine being able to work on content. We're also super excited. We've just got two new grants on badging. Um, in the past two weeks. Um, one of them is Microsoft money that's come into the Smithsonian. And you know, we're a design museum. We focus very much on the design process. And we know that that's linked with more straightforward fine arts in many ways, but it's separate in other ways too. So we're really excited that we got this grant that allows us to partner with our friends at the Hirshhorn, which is the Smithsonian Art Museum. And they have a great after school space called Art Lab that some of you might have heard of. So. Our next step is to badge kids more interested in perhaps in fine arts um, and design as well, but we're going to play around with the Hirshhorn on that with the idea that we would pr be providing not just a portfolio prep, but a sense of putting those classes together so that the Smithsonian could have a model for kids interested in fine arts. And then we just got a planning grant from Hive in New York City to see how we can take this badging and connect it to um, other cultural institutions in New York in the after school space. So we're kind of you know, some people might think that we're a little off mission, but I think that as a design museum, design is so integral into this process and the connection between sort of, you know, design is about problem solving and design is about sort of, I think it's the, one of the most optimistic things one can do, that idea of finding something that doesn't work and figuring out how to make it better. Um, and in this case, it might be the, pro the problem or challenge might be connecting underserved kids to these institutions. So everything about it makes it a design problem. So we think we're actually in the right space. So we're really excited and would love any questions or um, comments. We also want you to visit the Cooper Hewitt. Uh, our emails are up, so we'll, although our admission fee is going up to $18, call us and we'll get you all in for free. Uh, <laughs> but does anyone have any questions? Well, I want to encourage everyone to use the microphone oh. when they ask questions because not only are we uh, amplifying to the house, but we're also amplifying to our YouTube feed.
really, I'm from New York City, so. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and there's any number of people like you and others who are trying their hardest to reach the youth in New York City who have been totally marginalized in their school careers, including middle school, from access to art and design. And um, we're actually, I'm at Pratt, and we're, we've just conducted research on middle school access in uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant, Central Brooklyn, mm -hmm. to go along with a, a big report that you're aware, probably aware of, the Controller's Office studied access in schools and demonstrated and exposed that it's really an inequitable, terribly inequitable situation in the city. So what's happening though is that the, and I'm sorry, I just want to just quickly say this, is that the school system, instead of trying to change what's happening during school, their focus is after school and other providers and not changing what goes on in classrooms and what's offered to students um, who need it and who need and so the people who do get into art school in New York City again the majority which you probably know are the students who have middle school access and high school access to the mm -hmm. arts so it's my question really is how does this their experiences that you provide these these workshops how how do they supplement those with the necessary academic experiences that these other kids have in the arts and design so that they can actually get into art school because right. they don't have it. Right. And it's clear, we know what the research says. If they don't have those experiences starting in middle school, they don't get in. Even if they've got a great portfolio, they don't right. get in. And you're right, we're all about, we want them, if they choose, they want to do this to not only get in, but to go in and succeed because nothing is worse in some ways than a kid who gets in and is put in a position where they can't succeed. We agree with you about middle school. We actually just got a new grant from Deutsche Bank to take our work and teen programs and start developing it in for middle school kids in our space with Harlem, so we're excited about that. Um, I think this is one of the reasons why working with ACAT is so important, not just on the badging, but on the content. I th I think it's super hard to imagine that the schools in the position they're in right now are gonna change unless they see some this is why MacArthur has moved out of the K through 12 space in formal places. It looks like even in the work we're doing with schools, school systems themselves or even individual districts think about change only when something that's demonstratedly working in the out of school space is they can see that it helps them. They're not an experimental group when it comes to you know, their own stuff. So I think that working with ACAT is important, not just on the portfolio review, but in this idea of it may not be in creating courses, but it might be looking at what we do to make sure that, you know, Cooper Hewitt or the Met or the MoMA or, you know, that perhaps, again, using the internet is by experimenting with some of the stuff, at least that we can get across a set of skills and ways of thinking that will help these kids in any of their after school programs to try to shore up some of that skill making. And it might mean working with some of the ACAD folks to figure out that their, the ultimate goal for what they want might need to be achieved at different, less formal ways, right? So it's, it's thinking about what are those ultimate goals, what are all the ways that a kid could get to that point, um, and sort of diversifying the ways that, that can happen, knowing that it's the, the thing that isn't gonna happen is that schools are gonna change what they're doing right now and give these kids the courses. So it's like, how do we look at what they need and think of creatively about new ways of getting them that? I didn't mean to shut it down. Any other questions? Um, here are our emails. Um, we've had a lot of interest from ACAD schools who want to be part of the pilots. If you want to, um, we're looking just to kind of get out there, we're looking for geographic diversity. So um, for those of you in the four flung corners of the United States and you want to participate, let us know. I see there are a few minutes left, so I just want to ask maybe two questions. You're looking inward at serving populations and really trying to give them access to things, which is wonderful. I'm thinking about the transferability of these technologies and what does this imply both for a public school system across the country, which is being challenged in terms, in terms of its funding streams, um, localities, and in state levels all around, and thinking about what th does this imply for uh, these school systems 
being able to make the argument that they need more resources. In other words, if students are able to get these kinds of badging credentials outside of the public schools and develop their educations, it's great. But what does that mean for public schools, one? And the second question is about individual sense of self-worth and development. What does the digital credentialing mean for students as they grow up and see that their self-value perhaps is systematized by a data set, a sort of rich data environment where their sense of worth is derived through that. So it's sort mm -hmm. of two different questions about really the broader implications of badging in a way. Right. And we'll be super quick because although it seems like there's six minutes left, we, uh, we want to make sure you get a snack and come back here by 10. So. <laughs> um, I think that I'll let Lima deal with the self-worth question because she's the one who runs the program and I think um, one of the things that we had to think about in doing the badging was to make sure that the kids placed a tremendous amount of worth on the harder accomplishments. Absolutely. They, the students, I'm always surprised at how savvy, and I don't know if it's because they're New York City students or because they're inner city kids or what, but they seem incredibly savvy and the way that they value their, their self-worth is not predicated on these digital pieces, um, but they very much understand or see the need to have an outside um, advocate or support. So the badges, while it makes some of the learning visible or it makes it very um, easy and you said systematized, I think that fits into the way that the job market is moving where we're using tools like LinkedIn and we're using digital tools to help define and explain who we are and what we know. Um, but the students themselves, when they came to us and started talking to us about badges, they were like, I want a badge for photography. I'm a great photographer. Like, I want something that shows people how, what I can do. I want to earn a badge for, for this skill. Can I earn one for Photoshop? Can I earn one for this? They came to us and were like, this is what I want to show people I know how to do. And they, they know that <coughs> the Cooper Hewitt says, oh, this is something they know, it m carries more weight than if it's just them sort of putting themselves out there as like, I'm a photographer. And so I think they just sort of understand the idea that it's not just about self-worth um, and sort of knowing what they know. They are very confident, or most of them are quite confident in, in their abilities, but need that outside voice to sort of endorse them or, or recommend them in a way that I think digital badges can do. So it makes things visible, but most of the things were already there. I don't know if that answers a little bit. And I think in relation to the school systems, like we know that there's all sorts of challenges with that and we want them of course to be on board and be able to offer these kids as many opportunities as they need and deserve. Um, in the meantime, until that happens, we need to make sure these kids get the support that they need and deserve. One of the things I find super interesting in the badging space is that New York City is developing its own badging initiative, and they're starting with actually kids who drop out of school to get them to finish their, their, to, to finish their GED. So this, I think we now live in a world where increasingly formal school systems are looking for the experimentation to be done outside and then they're thinking about bringing that back in. So I don't preclude that some of this won't find itself embedded in the school systems at some point. Um, it just, there's no time or money for it in there and we're just trying to make sure that uh, these kids get a chance and if we can demonstrate that different ways of doing things might end up being more advantageous, we're happy to do that. Thanks.